And good morning. You know, we live in a society that uh, really is full of options, and that's part of the American way. Um, I mean, we don't just have like one supermarket. We don't just have King Supers. We have Albertsons. We have Safeway and a bunch of others. And when you go into a supermarket, um, it's amazing the variety that's in there. Um, every once in a while, um, meet somebody who's come over from overseas somewhere, and they go into one of our supermarkets, and they come out, and they're just like blown away of the choices. They can't believe, like they go in and they can't, like how many options can you have of toilet paper in one place? It's crazy. And soap and shampoo and, and soup and all the different kind of things. We have so much uh, variety that's out there for us, options. Uh, we, we don't just, just have um, one, one form of, uh, you know, like a Home Depot, but we have Lowe's and we have Ace Hardware and, and others. We have Nissans and Hondas and Toyotas and Fords and Chevrolets, and you can go on uh, for a long time on that. Uh, we have McDonald's and Burger King and Carl's Jr. and Five Guys and someday, God willing, In-N-Out Burger um, <laughs> around here. And all the ex-Californians and Arizonans said amen um, to that. We got email and Facebook and Twitter. We got all of that. We got public school or you can have a private school or you can do homeschool. Um, you can direct TV, Dish Network, Comcast. I don't know if you have voted yet, um, but when you check out the presidential section, there's like 15 that are going for president. There's like 15 different political parties. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, I've only seen two presidents at the debates, or not two presidents, but one trying to be and one who is. And, and, and yet we just are a society of variety and options, and we are definitely a consumer society. In fact, we don't like anybody telling us this is your only niche, your only way, um, this is your only option. We don't like that. In fact, if, if we get that, we'll push that aside and we'll go somewhere else and, or, or develop something new because we want a whole bunch of choices uh, around us. And we feel the way about religion, too. I mean, look at our society with religion. We have all sorts of re religions in our society and throughout the world. You've got Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and Wicca and Mormonism and Christianity. Even within Christianity, you've got all sorts of different subgroups. You've got denominations. You've got, you know, Baptists and and you got Presbyterian, you got the Calvary Chapel guys, and, and, and you've got uh, Evangelical Free, and you go on and on about all sorts of just even subgroups within Christianity. And, and, and we all uh, want this variety ar around us. And as Jesus is going about and doing his ministry on earth, a guy comes up to him that we figure out is a Jew, although his name is not given, it doesn't tell anything about him, but by Jesus' answer, we know that he's a Jew. And he asked Jesus a question kind of about this. He asked the question, um, Lord, will those who are saved be few? He's asking, will there only be a few people who go to heaven, or will there be a whole bunch of people who go to heaven? And, and what's, you know, what, what do you say on this, this issue? I want to tell you that what we're going to talk about today, outside of Christianity, will not fly very well. Outside of Christianity, when people look at the passage we're going to look at today and what Jesus teaches, they're going to reject it. And they're not going to like it. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn them to the Gospel of Luke to chapter 13. Luke 13. We're still in the New Testament. Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And if you don't have a Bible with you, we want you to take a Bible there in front of you and take it out. Page 873, you'll get to Luke 13. And if you don't have a Bible at home, we want you to have that Bible. It's our gift to you. We want you to read it and take it home and be best blessed by it. And I want you to understand uh, a very important background truth that'll make uh, this passage make sense. And that is this. The Jewish people in Jesus' day believed that Jewish people, all Jewish people went to heaven just because they were Jews. There was a, a little tiny exception in there. And that is that, that really bad Jews, if you will, that the murderers, the rapists, the really extreme sinners would not go to heaven, but all the other Jews would go to heaven automatically just because they're Jews. They also believed that those who were not Jews, which are Gentiles, like I'm a Gentile, I'm, I'm German and Dutch, so I'm not a Jew, so I'm a Gentile, that all Gentiles will not go to heaven because they're not Jews, with rare exceptions. And the rare exceptions are those few Gentiles who embraced Judaism and would follow the laws of Judaism and the ways of Judaism. They were known in that day as proselytes. So a man comes to Jesus and he asks him, will there be few who go to heaven? What he's asking is, is it just the Jews who are going to get in and everybody else in the world 
doesn't get in. That was basically the belief of the Jewish people in Jesus' day. With that as a background, let's look at this account beginning in verse 22 of chapter 13. We'll go through verse 30 today. And Jesus went on his way, verse 22, through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. So he is on his way to Jerusalem where he eventually is going to die on the cross. He's, he's on his trek there. Verse 23, and someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west, from north and south, and recline a table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Look again at verse 23, where Jesus said, And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Or the Good News Translation puts it, Sir, will just a few people be saved? Will it just be the Jews? How would you answer this? How do you think our modern day society would answer this question? There's many common beliefs today about the afterlife and salvation. For instance, there are those who believe there is no afterlife. That what you see is what you get here on earth, and then when you die, it's all over, and there's no other afterlife at all. So eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. I get the most out of life because this is it. There are certainly those who believe that. There are those today who believe that there is a heaven, but there's not a hell. They believe that because they believe that, that God is a loving God, and so he would never send anyone to hell, and therefore there's only heaven and there's not hell. There are those today who believe that there are different levels of heaven, different grades of heaven, and depending upon how you lived on earth would depend on what happens to you with your afterlife. There are those who believe that most people go to heaven and only the really uh, bad people go to hell. But most people go to heaven just like to be good and, and not a terrible person and not a murderer and a rapist and things like that. And then one of the big uh, beliefs today is what is known as pluralism. And pluralism teaches the acceptance that all religious paths are equally valid. It doesn't matter what door you open religiously, as long as you're sincere, you're going to get to, to heaven. All paths, all doors lead to God. Maybe you've seen this bumper sticker around town. Have you seen that? It's all over the place, isn't it? If you haven't seen it, open your eyes. <laughs> in, in one of these days, in front of you will be this bumper sticker. And it's a symbol that has the Islamic symbol and a symbol for Wicca, uh, for science, for Judaism, for Buddhism, Taoism, which is the Chinese religion, and the Christian faith. And it's like, let's coexist. Let's all, let's all get along. And all paths are equal. All paths are good. Let's have full tolerance for one another. And, and just, let's, let's, let's just keep it you know, cool between each other. And, and they would be highly offended if one of these groups claimed but we are the way and the right way, and the rest of you are the wrong way. And that intolerance doesn't go over really well with, with, with this thinking. Religious culture today says that any door will work. But what we're going to see here is that Jesus claims that there's only one door, and there's only one way. And like I said, outside of Christianity, this message doesn't fly very well. I mean, did you know that just in the United States of America alone, there's over 1,000 religions that are officially registered? Over 1,000 religions right here. I mean, how do you know what door to open? How do you know what door to go through? There's over 1,000 options officially recognized and registered here in the United States. 
I mean, does it matter which door you choose? <laughs> so if you're disappointed that I was so short, huh? <laughs> a door's everywhere. How do you know what door to go into? And a lot of people say it doesn't matter what door you open, just go through a door, it'll be fine. Look at verse 24. Jesus said, Strive to enter through the narrow door. Through the narrow door. The word narrow is a word with a lot of negative connotation because it can mean uh, confined and restricted and cramped and exclusive and limited. I'm, I'm claustrophobic. I don't like narrow. We were in Israel a year and a half ago and, and part of our tour was two different times to go down like in the caverns and in the caves and through the long tunnels underground and some of the areas were incredibly thin and narrow, and I just said, you know what, I'll see you guys on the other side where you come out. Enjoy. Have a great time. I'm not going in there. I don't do good with narrow. Our society doesn't do good with narrow. Because narrow sounds bigoted, and it sounds intolerant, and it sounds unloving. And for those who look at Christianity and think it is a narrow and bigoted faith, you must understand that it's not because there's a feeling of arrogance or superiority. It's because Jesus teaches, the Bible teaches, that there's a narrow door and there's a narrow way. A number of months ago, I invited Dr. Mike, Dr. Mark Young, president of Denver Seminary, to come speak to our ministry staff. Uh, Mark's preached here before. He's become a friend. And um, he came and he spoke to us as a ministry staff. And he used in his uh, time with us 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, which reads, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. And then he asked us a question as a staff. He asks, what is seen as foolish about the gospel in the Denver metro area today? And then he gave us uh, his answer to that. He says, what's foolish in our day and age here in our society is when there's a claim that there's only one God and only one way. When there's a claim of only one God and only one way. Let's listen to what Jesus said about this. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are what? Few. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 9, he said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He says in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The apostle Peter, when standing before those who arrested him for preaching the gospel, he said to them in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. On that same occasion when Dr. Young was speaking to us, he said something that really hit me and I, and I wrote it down. He said this, he said, you cannot be an exclusivist, believing one God in one way, without being an evangelist. But if you really believe that Jesus is the only door toward salvation and all the other doors don't work, then you better be showing people to the door. 
You better be telling people that this door is the door that gets you to eternal life and none of the other doors will get you there. Even if you're misunderstood, if you know that that's the only way, then you better be talking about it. If you're an exclusivist, you need to also be an evangelist. That's why we're so big here on Transform Lives, period. It's our heartbeat. Because every single weekend as we do ministry here and throughout the week as well, there are people who come here, people that we touch, who haven't figured out yet that Jesus is the only way, the only door to get to heaven. And so we will keep talking about it and keep talking about it and keep talking about it in hopes that they'll get it. Because the implications, if you don't get it, is an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Why does Jesus say in the second half of verse 24 these words? He says, For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. I mean, if he's all about salvation and, and those who do not know him to come to faith in him, why would those who seek him not be able to enter and to get in? And the answer to that is there will be a point of no return for everybody. There will be a point of no return. Look at verse 25. He says, When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, that's the point of no return, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. The Bible teaches that there are three points of no return. There's death. When, when you die, when I die, that's it. You can't have a do-over. You can't come back a second time to, to try to get it better, to try to understand uh, faith better. You, you have one chance while you're alive on this earth. Once you die, there's no point of return. A second point of no return is when Jesus returns himself. On that day, the world will be done as we know it as of today. And before he comes, you've got to make that decision go through the door of, of Jesus or not. The third point of no return that we find in the Bible is on a very rare occasion. It's an individual who has hardened their heart to the point that they are so deeply callous that, that they're at a point of no return. That would be the very rare individual. And, and if you're even worried about that being true in your life, the fact that you would even be worried about it means you don't have to worry about it. How's that? The fact that you're, probably, that you're even here probably means that you don't have to worry about that. That's the, the worst case, the most hardened of hearts. But there will be a point of no return. Death, the return of Christ, or for that rare example, a person who's just completely hardened their heart against, against God. And Jesus tells them in, in verse 24 to strive to enter through the narrow door, to strive for it. Now that doesn't mean that now all of a sudden salvation is about works and you work for it and you work hard for it and you have a lot of effort for it. No, the idea of striving for the, the door means that you make salvation the highest and the utmost of all priorities, that you strive for it. There's nothing more important than, than your eternal destiny. There's nothing more important than eternal life. And so you must strive for it and make that your key focus more than any other focus possible for you. Strive for that. And then Jesus gives a warning in the midst of what he says here that we must all pay attention to. He says it to the Jewish people then, but he also says it for us today. And that is that there are people who hang out with Jesus on earth who will not hang out with him in heaven. Let me say that again. There are people who hang out with Jesus on earth who will not hang out with him in heaven. Look at verse 26. He's just saying that people are going to say, hey, Lord, open up to us. And he said, I don't know where you came from. And then you will begin, verse 26, to say, hey, we ate and drank in your presence. And you taught in our streets. We hung out with you, Jesus. We ate with you. We, we spent time with you. We, we listened to you when you taught. It'd be like people today who say, but, but Jesus, I went to church. I went to Mission Hills Church. I went there and sat in the nice seats and had my, had my latte and, and sang the songs and gave money occasionally and even served and, and helped out every once in a while here and there. I listened to the guy preach over and over again. <laughs> we hung out with you, Jesus, while we were here on this earth. What do you mean we can't get in? 
See, the Jewish people thought that they just got in because they were Jews. A lot of people think they can get in just because they go to church or just because they live a good life. That's not how you get in. You get in through the door. And the door is Jesus. And he's the only door. You might be here and you're doing a lot of good things. But you're not striving after the door. Jesus Christ himself. Look at verse 27 and 28. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are cast out. We keep getting this, the same teaching from Jesus over and over again in the Gospel of Luke that says, you're either on my team or you're not on my team. And if you're not on my team, you're on Satan's team. There's actually only two doors. There's the door to heaven and there's the door to hell. And the door to heaven is through Jesus and the door to hell, you, you, there's all sorts of different doors you can go through, but there's really only one door besides the one to heaven. And you're either for me or you're against me. And he calls them workers of evil. Not because they're all horrible people, but if you're not for Christ, ultimately you're you're for Satan and then there's evil. And he says as Jews, they're going to see the prophets and the great leaders of old in, in glory, but they themselves got shut out. Why? Because they didn't go through Jesus. And Jesus, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I Never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You think, wait a minute. You mean the people who who did the work of the ministry aren't getting in? The missionaries, the pastors, the Sunday school teachers? What is he saying here? Remember who he's talking to. He's telling the Jewish people, just because you're a Jew and just because you do the works of the law doesn't get you in. And he's telling us on this day, just because, again, you do the good works and you go to church and you serve doesn't mean you get in. There's only one way in, and that's through the door, and that's through Jesus. Listen to what Jesus tells them. Look at verse 29. He says, And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline a table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Remember, the Jewish people thought that they're the only ones going in. And what Jesus is saying here is the door to heaven is open not just for Jewish people. He's telling the Jews of that day, people from the north are going to come and be in heaven. And people from the south are going to come. People from the east are going to come. People from the west are going to come. People from all over the world are going to come and be a part of this. Not just you. And then he tells them that the door to heaven is open for all types of people. Verse 30. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Yeah, there will be some Jews in heaven, certainly. Those who have given their life to Jesus Christ. But there's also going to be a lot of Gentiles. The people that that you think won't get in. But there will be a lot of Gentiles there, too. And there's going to be slaves there and handicapped people there and poor people there, along with bosses and rich people and people of privilege. There's going to be all skin colors there and all languages there and all ethnic backgrounds there and all economic statuses there. It's not just going to be this little huddled group that you think that, you know, because you are a Jew that you're in. No. It's going to be open for all people. 
if you go through the door of Jesus. And so here's what you need to understand. This is what you need to get. And that's that Christianity is inclusive, not exclusive. Christianity is inclusive. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you all one in Christ Jesus. And Dr. Philip Reichen, president of Wheaton College, helps with this explanation when he says, in one sense, Christianity is the most exclusive of all religions. According to Jesus himself, there is only one narrow way to salvation. Those who find it are included. Everyone else is excluded. But in another sense, Christianity is the most inclusive of all religions. It is not just for people from a particular ethnic background. It is not just for people who are able to obey God better than other people or who have reached a certain level of enlightenment. You do not have to be any smarter, any more religious, or any holier than anyone else. You just have to be a sinner who is praying for God to give you grace in Jesus Christ. All you have to be is a sinner who fits. Hmm. Pastor Andy Stanley from North Point Church says with regards to salvation, and I love what he says, he says, first of all, everybody's welcome. Jesus came to, to die for all people, all races, all ethnicities, all languages, all colors, all economic statuses, all religious backgrounds. He came for all people. Secondly, he says everybody gets in the same way, through the narrow way, through the door that's Jesus Christ. Everybody gets in the same way. There's not different paths. We don't coexist. Everybody gets in the same way. And third, he says everybody can meet the requirement. Everybody can meet the requirement. The requirement, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior in need of the forgiveness of God. Now please, please listen because you need to understand why the Bible teaches that there's only one way and that's through Jesus. Please, please listen. God is holy. And because he is holy, he does not allow anything that's less than holiness in his kingdom in heaven. Therefore, sin cannot enter his kingdom because he's holy. So we got a real problem on our hands because we're sinful. And with sin in our own life, we are now separated from a holy God. And there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to become sinless. And so God, out of his great love, out of his compassion, out of his grace and mercy, sent Jesus, his son, to this earth to wipe away our sin so that we could stand in heaven in a state of holiness before a holy God. So when Jesus came and he died on the cross, as we say, he died on the cross for our sins, what we're saying there, what the Bible teaches there, is that Jesus literally took on our sin on himself when he went on the cross. Even though it's 2,000 years ago, literally he was putting on your sin and my sin, taking them on as if he's the one who did the sin, like he was the one who was guilty of them. And through his body being broken and through his blood being shed, he was the sacrificial holy lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, the Bible says. That is why only through Jesus can one truly be saved. Only through Jesus can one have eternal life. Because only he can forgive us of our sin and make us holy and right before God. You say, no, wait a minute. 
So I, I pray the prayer. I give my life to Jesus. I ask for the forgiveness of my sins. He forgives me of my sins, cleans me up, but then I continue to sin. That's true. We still struggle with sin. We'll struggle with sin until we die. But because we've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus on the cross, we, when we go and die, we will be in a right standing before a holy God because all of our sin was done away with. You say, well, that's cool. That means that then I can just sin all I want because once I've asked for God to forgive me of my sins, I'm all, I'm all clean, and I can go live like, like a crazy man and, and sin. Uh, and, and the Apostle Paul writes about that, and he says, um, should I sin all the more that grace may abound all the more? And he says, may it never be. Like, why would you want to do that, he says. If you understand truly that Jesus died for your sins and gave himself for you, has prepared a place for you, you're not going to want to live like that. You're not going to want to sin in those ways. You're going to want to follow him and be obedient. This is why only through Jesus can one be saved because only he can make us right with the holy God. It's not to be exclusive. It's not to be intolerant. It's not to be bigoted or arrogant. It's because he's our only hope for eternal life. And if you have never given your life to him and asked for the forgiveness of your sin and been cleaned up and embraced his gift of eternal life, well, there's a reason that you're here today that God brought you here today to receive this truth and today you can give your life to Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry about a point of, of no return because if you walked out of here and got smashed on the way home, God forbid, that's kind of a bad picture, isn't it? But if that were to happen, you're good. But you do it because you want to follow him and because you love him. Not just to get out of a problem. Hell. <laughs> if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to offer that gift to you through the Lord and through prayer. I'm going to say the prayer, but you make it of your heart. To embrace Jesus, to get the forgiveness of your sins, and to embrace the gift of eternal life. And so I want you right where you are, just to, to focus on the Lord. So I want you to actually bow your heads, close your eyes, whatever that takes, if you're just to focus and not focus on anything else around you. And Lord, if, Lord, may you hear our prayers right now as we come before you. And may you move in our midst right now. Now, if you have never prayed this prayer to receive Christ, again, you just say it with me. You can say it quietly. You can say it without any volume or you can say it out loud. But dear Lord God, dear Lord God, I believe that Jesus is the only way to eternal life. That he is the only door that opens up eternity. And so today I invite Jesus into my life to be my Lord and Savior the one who saves me, the one who leads me. I pray that you would please forgive me of my sin. All of it. All the hurts, all, all the times I've hurt other people, the times I've hurt you, Lord. Forgive me of my sin and wash me clean. And remove from me the guilt and the shame. And I embrace your gift of eternal life that comes only through Jesus Christ so that I know that on the day that I die I will live eternally with you. Oh Lord, thank you that you have reached out to us and offered us this gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that is available for all people. Lord, for those of us who know you and follow you and love you, may we 
be those who show other people to the door. And tell them about you. And may they understand and may they come to faith in you, Lord. And Lord, as we now turn our attention to remember what you did for us on that day on the cross, may you use this time in our own lives as we talk to you, hear from you, as we worship you. Lord, may you hear our prayers of gratitude and love and thanksgiving. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.